She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the bonus video for the Manson series which is a coffee and crime time called The Manson Family, The Aftermath. What happened to them after the trial? What happened to them as they grew old in prison? Some of them. Some of them didn't make it to prison, surprisingly, but let's talk about it. Oh, but before we do, I want to show you my new Hunt Killer box came today. I'm so excited. So I'm going to pop it open and just kind of give a peek inside. Guys, if you have not tried Hunt Killer yet, check out the link in the description box. I know that they are um, helping us out today and they are going to give you 20% off your first box. It's basically a, an, an awesome, inclusive and participatory game of Clue that you can play with your friends, your family, you can play with people online. They send you a new box with all sorts of files and um, police files and clues and evidence. And then you will use the boxes to add onto the boxes you've already gotten to solve a crime every season. And I'm really loving this season. So I in this box, there's a big envelope with all the police files and stuff, but I also have two bags that say evidence on them. So this first one that says evidence on it, Yeah, like it says it's like a pill box or something it's so, oh there's a note in there oh Deb's gonna be so mad I'm opening this without her so it's an it's a prescription for Arthur Hughes for diazepam <laughs> so it is a pill box and then the next little evidence bag has it looks like a class ring in it oh my god it says CFHS and if you guys are already playing the season's hunt to killer um, you will know what that means because it's like a class reunion, a murder at a class reunion that we're trying to solve, so it's fancy. Oh, and it's a big fat envelope of evidence this time around. <gasps> There's pictures in here and a newspaper clipping. Oh my God, guys. See, I can't even, there's like actual pictures in here. This is awesome. I can't even look at this right now because I have to wait till Neb comes to help me. Oh, and there's like a little letter, like handwritten letter. Oh my God, February 3rd, 1998. It's dated with a little flower. <laughs> Anyways, I'm really excited for Neb to come over tomorrow so that we can finish this up or get this box started at least because we've been waiting. I think we completely like perused all the evidence of the other box. We have our murder board set up. We were ready for this one, so. Hunt Killer, it's awesome. It's so much fun. It's a nice like downtime activity for me to do that's not as like stressful as investigating a real murder. So if you guys wanna check it out, click the link in the description box and you'll get 20% off your first box. All right, so let's talk about the Manson family. What happened after? What happened to all these people, man? Where did they go? Did any of them ever get out of prison? Go on to lead normal lives? Susan Atkins, there's two things that most people who go to prison find behind bars. God and a new interest in the law. Susan Atkins found both. Once Susan went to prison, she never saw her son again. He was adopted and his name was changed and I don't know where he is. I couldn't locate him and nor would I want to. Nobody should have to have that follow them. He had nothing to do with it. However, in 1985, she received a letter from a young man named James Whitehouse who had read her autobiography called Child of Satan, Child of God. Yes, she wrote an autobiography. He wanted to know how she'd conquered her demons after all she'd done. He was going through a hard time himself and he was trying to figure out, you know, how does one come back from that? She was 37 at this time. She was already corresponding with multiple males who have like this attraction to murderous women, I guess. And she thought she was at a place in her life where she could help a young man who was seeking a new path. White House was 22 at the time, and when they began writing back and forth, he would often visit her in prison and would comment on how calm her presence was. She had this calming, sort of like peaceful demeanor. In December of 1987, the two were married and the bride wore white. 
White House's family claims the relationship with Susan Adkins saved him and changed him for the better. She applied for parole many times, claiming to be remorseful for the murders, claiming to be a different person. You know a person by their behavior. And my behavior in this, in, in this institution speaks to the change that occurred over 30 years ago. I'm not the same person that I was when I came in here. Do you expect to be out someday? I would like to be out someday. I hope to be out someday. And it's amazing that I still have hope. But the families of the victims were at every single parole hearing, making sure that she would never see the light of day again. By the time she was 49, she'd gotten her associate's degree in prison and she was training to be a paralegal. Her psychiatrist said that she had matured into a far different person, albeit with a troubling tendency to minimize her role in the slayings. I find the exact same, that she always was the one who wanted to minimize her role in the murders of Sharon Tate and her friends. She never really took accountability for it. It was always somebody else's fault. It was always Charlie or Tex or the power of the collective that had come over her and you know she was too far gone at that point. So she obviously never got out on parole, thank God. She developed brain cancer in 2008 and she survived long enough to celebrate her 21st wedding anniversary before dying on September 24th, 2009. My words to Susan Atkins would have been the same that she gave to Sharon Tate. Woman, I have no mercy for you. She asked me to What'd you say to her? She said in an interview once that she'd made every effort to apologize to the family of Sharon Tate. And in every single interview that you see of her, she talks in that quiet, childlike, serene voice. I'm a different person now, and I'm sorry for the things that I've done. I know I've hurt people. Ugh, I don't buy it. I've never bought it. Not once, not ever, never not once did I ever buy that Susan Atkins was as naive and innocent and sweet as she tried to make herself seem. This is a girl who bragged at every opportunity to tell everybody what she'd done, to let everybody know that she'd been involved explicitly and completely in committing these crimes. Patricia Krenwinkel, she lost her latest parole bid in late 2016 and she will be eligible for parole again in 2022. She's California's longest serving female inmate since Susan died, and hopefully she stays that way. She had a parole hearing in 2011 where she was commended for her work with prison dogs, her success at earning her bachelor's degree, and her clean disciplinary record. The most recent ploy on behalf of Pat Krenwinkel's lawyer is to say that Manson abused her and she was the victim of intimate partner battery. In an interview in 2010 with Diane Sawyer, Pat claims, I only did what Charlie wanted. That was the whole thing. She said she wasn't a bad girl when she met Manson. That that savagery could live in you. I don't believe any of us had any concept of really what we were doing. In other words, I don't even think we know how to define what brings death. We were so locked in like, it's just like, okay, okay. Just somehow, if I just keep doing this, this will make death. This will bring death. And in the 2010 interview, she tells a different story than her lawyer would say years later about her being a victim of intimate abuse or intimate partner abuse. She says she felt loved by him. She says she loved him back. She said he made her feel special and beautiful. And that doesn't sound to me like somebody who felt that they were being abused who can look back, I mean, this is 2010, so this is how many years later that she's saying she felt loved, she felt special, she felt beautiful, she loved him back. If you cannot, that many years later, get a perspective where you say, oh, I was abused by him, he hit me, he violently forced me to do these things, where is this coming from all of a sudden now? In a 2014 interview, she claimed she gave up every little bit of herself to that man that demanded every little bit of her. Therefore, she was giving up the person she could have been. She blames her childhood, of course. She grew up in a house where silence was golden to her parents. Uh, they didn't talk about issues that they had. They didn't talk about real life things. She said she never felt like she fit in or she belonged. She was watching her family fall apart. She got close to an older sister who was into drugs and ba basically it was all downhill from there. And all I hear from Pat Krenwinkel is, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's my parents' fault. 
Uh, they never talked about their issues. It's my older sister's fault because she was involved in drugs. She introduced them to me. It's Manson's fault because he took every little bit of me that I had left. She's never saying, yes, me, Pat Krenwinkel, I did those things knowingly and I take full responsibility and you know, I just hope that you can see I've changed in order to get parole. She's just literally pushing the blame off on everybody else, just like her buddy Susan. Never had ever developed the sense of knowing who I was and where I was going and what I wanted to do. Because I wanted to please. I wanted to be loved. I wanted for the first time to feel safe. I wanted to feel like someone was going to care for me because I hadn't felt that from anywhere else in my life. It sounds to me like she's still spouting the Manson rhetoric that parents are responsible for how badly their children turn out. So parents are to blame for everything that happens to their children in life. And at some point you have to realize you grew up, you were an adult at one point and you, you did these things anyways. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't your parents who just didn't want to talk about their divorce with you who caused you to murder people. So Pat Krenwinkel, we'll see if she gets parole. I am, you know, hoping against hope she does not. And it just seems like she's always been more concerned with why she did what she did instead of the fact that she did what she did. Leslie Van Houten, she has been recommended for release three times by the parole board who says she's no longer a risk to society, but it's been denied by a judge each time. She's now 69 years old and her case is currently under review. Soon a decision will be made whether she will be released from prison. Deborah Tate, who's Sharon Tate's sister, she's always been a strong advocate for making sure none of the Manson family ever get out of prison. So she's on top of this whole parole thing. She's there at every one. She's gonna make sure that Leslie does not get out. Leslie still wants to claim, of course, that she never killed anybody, but as I said in the video, the videos about Manson, there's no way to know if she stabbed Rosemary LaBianca after Rosemary was dead. And even so, what kind of person are you that you're just gonna stab the, the body of a dead woman that was just murdered by your friends while you stood there and let it happen? What kind of person does that make you? Does that make you a sane person? Does that make you a person who's not a threat to society? In my opinion, no, but we'll see what happens with the parole board. She claims at one point at the LaBianca's house that she was very torn inside. She felt she needed to be a good soldier. I suppose Leslie, out of all of them, would be the least problematic. The, the person that I would say if somebody was gonna get parole would probably be the one to get parole just because there is so little proof actually tying her to any of the murders. And there's so much speculation and reasonable doubt as to whether Rosemary LaBianca was alive when Leslie stabbed her. But if it was my decision, if I could have it my way, none of them would ever, ever get out. There will always be people who feel that I should never be granted my freedom. And I respect that with the LaBianca family. And I apologize to you from the bottom of my heart for the pain and the sorrow that I have caused your family and it will come for generations to come that you have this cloud over you and I apologize for that. Tex Watson applied for parole in 1990 and he actually had Susan Labarge who is Rosemary LaBianca's daughter on his side as an advocate for his release. I've had much time to think about the crimes Charles committed. They affected me as much as anyone else who loved any of the victims. It has taken time, information, knowledge, and God's love for me to come to the opinion and conclusion that I have reached. I don't think any kind of fear is justifiable for keeping Charles in prison. For Charles, I believe 21 years of imprisonment and his having to live with the memory of what he did is punishment enough. It is my belief that Charles could live in society peacefully and should be given a parole date. Tex became a born again Christian and an ordained minister. He started a ministry called Abounding Love Ministries. Susan, at the time, also a born again Christian, says that Tex did change. He got married in prison and he fathered four children through conjugals while in prison, but he was divorced in 2003. In October of 2016, he was denied parole for the 17th time. Now Tex is, like I've always said, to me, one of the worst people in the situation. There's like Manson and Tex Watson, and to me, they're on the same level. 
Tex Watson has been in trouble multiple times with the government for using the proceeds from Abounding Love Ministries to basically support his family, which you're not supposed to do. That's illegal. The records show that Charles and Kristen Watson committed Medi-Cal fraud when they used tax paid funds to pay for the births of three of their children. His ex-wife, Kristen, she's never worked. And obviously Tex wasn't home to bring in the bacon. So ALMS, or Abounding Love Ministries, that's ALMS, I'll call it that. Um, they obviously were paying for her to live and support herself and her children or else where's the money coming from? None of the four children have ever attended public schools. Kristen prefers to homeschool them. Um, get this, because the couple don't want their children corrupted by the evils of society. An interesting statement from a man who brutally murdered several people. You don't want your children corrupted by the evils of society. I think it's more likely that Tex and Kristen did not want their kids to go to school and when they were old enough to understand, have their classmates tell them, your father's a murderer. He like brutally murdered a pregnant woman. An inmate who was with Tex in prison at one time claims that Tex said the following, when I killed those people, especially that foreign guy, Frykowski or whatever his name was, they didn't exactly stand there and do nothing. A lot of these guys in prison think they're bad and some of them are. But when it comes to being bad in every sense of the word, I have been bad before and I can play the role pretty good. This was after he found God, by the way. He told this man other things about how the murders were just tests, tests of the plan to see if they could cause nationwide fear. And he also told the inmate that Leslie should not be in prison because she didn't kill anyone, but he would not raise a finger to help or come forward on her behalf. He only wanted to help himself. Tex Watson has written two books, Will You Die For Me? and Forgiven, the Charles Watson story. Tex Watson is a scumbag. Tex Watson should never see the light of day. Tex Watson should not be allowed to be a part of this website for Abounding Love Ministries where it's giving advice to people on how to be a good person. He should not be allowed to do anything. Apparently he's given, because of his status as an ordained minister, he's given a lot more free reign of the prison. He runs services and performs ceremonies and things, and he basically just can do whatever he wants there. So he, he's a bad person. Clearly, he, he commits tax fraud. He acts like he's found God, but he's saying behind the scenes, um, you know, I know what being a bad guy is, and I know how to play that part really well. A person who's found God, a man of God, who strongly disagrees in the things that his past self did, I don't think he would say that. Linda Kasabian. The girl who got off scot-free because she turned on the others. Linda claims that even weeks after the trial, she felt guilty, that she had gotten off too easily. She can never accept the fact that she was not punished for her involvement. Same, Linda. Same. She pretty much dropped off the map for a while. She was avoiding the press, and when she resurfaced in 2009, she was living in a trailer park in near poverty. The one positive that I suppose we can find from Linda's part in this, even though she did end up, you know, getting off, Scott free from charges was Manson and his family probably never would have been convicted if not for her. And additionally, it doesn't look like her life went too well afterwards. It doesn't look like she had this free life or this life free of public scrutiny, this life free of guilt. It seems like these things did follow her and you know, she didn't, she didn't turn out too well in the end. Mary Brunner spent six years in prison for her part of the um, sporting goods store robbery that they got caught for at the end. After she was released, it is reported that she changed her name and moved to the Midwest and nobody knows where she is anymore. Mary Brunner did way more for the family to support Manson in the murders than Linda Kasabian did, if you think about it. And she is completely, like I said, she's dropped off the map. Nobody knows where she's at. She was Manson's first ever follower. She stayed with him until the very end. Even seeing how the cards were falling, she stayed with him. After she was released, she didn't run away and try to escape the family. She continued to be with them and support them. So this woman's a problem, but she's walking free. So if you're in the Midwest, be careful. Sandra Good. Sandy Good, from little mini socialites to completely committed cult member. She was actually in prison in 1976. She was imprisoned for a conspiracy to send threatening letters through the mail after sending hundreds of letters to company executives and reportedly making threatening phone calls, but she was paroled in 1985. Of course she was.
After her parole ended, she moved to Hanford, California in order to be closer to Manson. And in 1996, she and I think it's George Stimson, they began a pro-Manson website. Now, Sandra Good had a son named Ivan Pugh, and she says that Ivan's father was Bobby Beausoleil, but it's been speculated that the real father was Joel Pugh, a man who was found dead in a London hotel room under suspicious circumstances. Now, obviously, um, Sandra Good and her partner or husband, whatever he is, George Stimson, they, they lead a mostly quiet life now. I mean, they're, they're quite older. However, 24 years after the Manson murders, she was still going on talk shows and speaking out in approval and support for Charles Manson and what they had done, what the family had done. She was basically like their advocate on TV. She went on a show called The Beatrice Berry Show. I'll see if I can play you a little clip of that because it's definitely interesting. I'd like to say something. Why did my sister have to pay for it? She shouldn't have Why? been home. Please, Why Patty? my sister? Why all them? Why Patty? do we have to pay for Patty, this? I'll talk my to you about that. My sister was a good person. Hollywood and, and, is a no, And the thing is, the fact is, is that these people are murderers. And we have to protect ourselves from these type of people so they don't go out and kill more of us. Charlie's not a murderer. And that's, and that's Charlie's why not a murderer. But, but you're saying murder. that because she was in Hollywood and Hollywood is a hellish place, she had to die? No, here's the thing. When you're in Hollywood, when you're a woman and you put yourself in that milieu, your body is being exploited, your face is being, you're being literally sold. You're being sold for money. You're being used for money. Where is the concern that women in Hollywood, their image are shown for the, what's that, what I'm telling you, what I told you before, if you'd open your mind, those, we were at war with society, but the, the main catalyst for those killings was to get a brother out of jail, and I cannot so reiterate I, so my enough. family that had to pay for it. Look, in war, Why? people die, Patty, and I'll talk to you about that no. as long as you want to talk no. to me. To watching our, our kids come home in bags. So therefore, that meant that I had to watch my sister be rolled out of her people house in a bag. People are being killed too, every with her day. Belly out of here. So you don't kill. You get out there and you do the positive thing. The positive thing is that's helping one another. Well, once again, I have to ask myself, how brainwashed were these people? Because that's what they want to claim once they, they you know come forward and say they don't support it anymore. How brainwashed were these people? If 20 something years after Manson's in prison, you haven't seen him because you haven't been allowed to visit him, you haven't really been under his spell because how could you be? How brainwashed are they if they're still speaking out in support of murdering people to further the family's plan on national or you know public television? How brainwashed were they? How under his spell were they? I don't believe they ever were. Sandra Good is also somebody that I think was kind of devious and had a dark side to her from day one. Van Morehouse is another one of those people that's kind of dropped off the map. Now, I found a post from somebody on a website called The Data Lounge, and it says, my mother's friend has a secret. I just found out that my mother's lifelong friend since childhood was a former Manson follower. I am stunned. I've known this woman my whole life and cannot resolve my feelings towards her now. Evidently, her name was Ruth Ann Morehouse in her previous life. She has since changed her name, married, and raised a family, and she has managed to live a productive life without any obvious fallout from the crimes she was involved with. That's interesting. Especially considering Ruth Ann, who escaped being, you know, held responsible for the crime of trying to poison somebody with an overdose of LSD. She just completely escaped. Of course, she changed her name. Apparently on November 4th of 1975, Ruth Ann was found and she appeared in court to be sentenced. The judge did not give her any jail time. Instead, he ruled that because she was abandoned by her father when she was 14 years old and thrown willy-nilly into the Manson cult, she could go free with time served. So basically nothing happened to Ruth Ann. Nothing happened to crazy ass Ruth Ann who was basically so excited when she heard about the murders from Susan that she couldn't wait for them to do it again so that she could take part. Nothing happened. And yeah, does she have a messed up family life? Yeah. Her father, Dean Morehouse, he was crazy. He's the one that brought Manson into her life. And then when Manson took his young daughter, he found them and met up with them and started living with them. So yeah, I mean, definitely had a sketchy childhood. However, I don't think that she should have been, you know, 
just gotten off with no time. I don't think that she should have gotten off with no repercussions. However, she was incredibly young at that time. So even if she had gotten a harder judge, I don't believe that anything would have happened to her because she was still a minor at the time when she tried to poison somebody with LSD. But she's, you know, out there just living in people's neighborhoods, not telling them that she was a Manson girl. Bruce Davis is also still in prison, even though he's applied for parole multiple times. And in 2017, he was deemed eligible for parole by the parole board. Every time he's been put up for parole, it's been denied. His next chance for parole will be this coming August. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. So Bobby Beausoleil is serving life in prison for the murder of Gary Hinman. He's 71 years old right now and he was recommended for release by the Board of Parole Hearings in January. But on April 26th, last month, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, reversed that decision. The Manson family victims were informed of the decision on Monday, April 29th, 2019, and obviously everybody was relieved, including the cousin of Gary Hinman, Kay Hinman Martley, who said, I cannot tell you how elated I am. I'm just busting. I prayed so hard the governor would do the right thing. I don't believe any of the Manson family should be released. Now, Lynette Squeaky from Squeaky, crazy ass Squeaky. This girl is the one that I am worried about more than really any of them, honestly, because I don't think that any of the Manson girls who are in prison are ever gonna get out. I don't think Texas is ever gonna get out. I don't think Bruce Davis and Bobby Bosley are ever gonna get out. But Lynette, she is out, even though on September 5th of 1975, she attempted to assassinate Gerald Ford, the United States president. Apparently, she pointed a pistol at him on the public grounds of the California State Capitol building. She had not chambered around, the gun did not fire, no one was injured, but she was supposedly trying to make a statement to people who refused to halt environmental pollution. So Lynette Squeaky From is part of Manson's family. He goes to prison and a couple years later, she points a gun at a sitting US president. You think like this girl's going away for life, right? No, she served 34 years. I believe she was, yep, 34 years. She was released on August 14th of 2009. He had his hands out and was waving and had just come from breakfast with the, the uh, businessmen. And he looked like cardboard to me. Uh, but at the same time, I had ejected the bullet in my apartment and I used the gun as it was. It's, he was only two blocks away. I said, I gotta go and talk to him. And then I thought, that's foolish. He's not gonna stop and talk to you. People have already shown you can lay blood in front of them. And they're not, you know, they don't think anything of it. So I said, maybe I'll take the gun. And I thought, I have to do this. This is the time. I was unprepared. Now, there was a, a show about the Manson girls recently. They came out and she was on it. She's now 70 years old. And she basically said, I'm still in love with Charles Manson. Like, that's the big headline that, that they splashed all over after this show. I'm still in love with Charles Manson is what Squeaky From says. I don't think you fall out of love, she told ABC News. I feel very honored to have met him, and I know how that sounds to people who think he's the epitome of evil. I fall in love with him. Excuse me, I fall in love with him continuously, but he's, um, he's very brilliant. And yet, whatever he wants to be, I let him be that. She ended up getting in a relationship with an ex-convict who is basically obsessed with Charles Manson, and they live in upstate New York now. Come to find, as I was looking into this, and I put something on Twitter about it, but this girl literally lives this girl, she's a woman, she's 70 years old. This woman lives like two hours away from me. I could get in my car and drive and be at her house in two hours. And that scares me. See, now this is what I'm talking about. Why people are worried about the Manson family being paroled. Why are they worried? Because those people scare us. They scare us. People who can, A, if you wanna say you were brainwashed, you can be so easily brainwashed to do such horrific things, or B, are just evil inside and now you want to let them out and walk around in, in the public. Does it scare me that the girl lives two hours away? Does it scare me that I figured that out after I made an entire series talking shit about the man she still loves and, and basically you know her as well? Yes, it does scare me. Does that mean I would be adverse to sitting down with her and picking her brain and trying to figure out exactly 
how this happened and why she feels the way she feels and thinks the way she thinks. No, I would love to sit down with her in a well-lit, well-populated area and talk to her about that because even though I judge her and I, I disagree with her and I think that she was crazy and, and maybe still is, I am still open-minded enough to try to understand the way you think and why the things happen that happen. Just the same as I would have loved to sit down and talk to Charles Manson before he died. I don't think that what they did was right, but I'm still so interested in knowing what was going on in here when all of this happened. Do you have any regrets for that day? No. No, I don't. I feel it was fate. Was there an actual brainwashing? Was there an actual power struggle? Was somebody controlling others? And Squeaky, in my opinion, was running all of those girls from you know very short into her arrival at Spawn Ranch and with the family. She was the, the ringleader and you could tell in the videos, they're all looking to her to see what she's doing, to copy her, to follow her. She was Manson's like right hand girl. She would have done anything for him. And the fact that she's just kind of out there, not too far away from me, it does, it does make me feel unsettled. So now Charles Manson obviously spent the rest of his life in jail. He died in November of 2017 and uh, he was 83 years old. Manson did a lot of interviews after he was in prison. People obviously wanted to know um, what it was all about and understand his point of view. Just like I was saying with, with Lynette, like I, I would feel the same way. I think journalists want to do that. He did a lot of interviews and it seemed like in each one he was playing his own version of the insane game. Oh, more, come on, more followers. More. Get it, Jasper, Bonnie, Boom Boom, Baby, Black Wait, Soul, Brandon. You said you were the heart of the place. I had no followers, but I'm not gonna sit here and tell you a bunch of malarkey. I'm not gonna fill you up with bunk. If I can't fill you up with right, I'm not gonna fill you up with nothing. So I'm filling you up with this. I tell you, and I tell you right up into the highest peak of your understanding, I did not break the law. But now, if you don't know the law, that's sad. It done. How do we do it? I don't know. I don't want to be involved in it. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. In Japan, they call it ninja. That doesn't make any sense. Well, over a period of about 20 years, I imagine you'd want to change something. I'm not very wise to many things, but I am wise to one thing, you know. What's that? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, okay. You are me and I am you. Everything you do is for you. It's for me, too. So what did they oh, think? Oh, if you're in one mind, if I am you and you are me and we are all together, and then who's responsible for a calm together over me right now? Ba -da 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 -da. It's all his fault. He would often act crazy, do crazy things, say crazy things. I'll play you some clips. He wouldn't answer questions directly. He kept basically saying the same thing. They did what they wanted. I didn't make them do anything. Helter Skelter was all fabricated. This Helter Skelter thing was fabricated by Vincent Bugliosi. It's a, I think he called it a fairy tale at one point. He spent the rest of his life in prison. He eventually turned the X that he had carved into his head into a swastika. He got tons of fan mail, tons of letters from women who were interested in having relationships with him. He even got engaged to one of them and then found out that all she wanted to do was wait till he died and then sell his body. So he broke off that engagement. Even Charlie Manson has standards, guys. So he dies, he was cremated, and his ashes were used in a blood painting that's displayed at a haunted museum in Las Vegas. The museum is called Zach Baggins Haunted Museum in Las Vegas. Zach Baggins is the host of the Travel Channel's Ghost Adventures. It opened in October of 2017, it looks like, and it sounds like a place that I want to go, by the way. It sounds like a place I want to go. The mansion has, you know, dark history. Back in the 1970s, there was devil worshiping in the basement. But among the collections in the museum, there's a Charles Manson collection where there's mysterious items, letters, and Charles Manson images. They are displaying a picture of Charles Manson that is made with the, uh, the blood of the artist and Charles Manson's alleged actual ashes. Baggins claims that the painting has a creepy energy connected to it and some people don't even feel comfortable looking it directly into its eyes. This is a charged piece and there's an energy about it, he says. 
After Manson died, there was a battle for his estate. The judge dismissed claims by two men who said they were sons of Manson. The two people who said that they were Manson's sons and were trying to get control of his estate were Matthew Lentz. He claims that he was fathered by Manson during a 1967 orgy. And Michael Bruner, who was Mary Bruner's son. Both of those men uh, eventually dropped out or were dismissed. Now, Matthew Lentz might actually be the son of Manson. He does have letters from Manson saying that he is his son. Michael Bruner, who a lot of people also believe was Manson's son, he lost the fight because he had been legally adopted by his grandparents. Therefore, he could not be deemed an heir. So that leaves Jason Freeman. Now, Jason Freeman was the son of Charles Manson Jr. Charles Manson Jr. changed his name to Jay White, and he actually committed suicide in 1993. Jason Freeman was actually awarded Manson's body in court after he died. He is considered to be his legal and rightful grandson. Now he's in a battle for the rest of the estate, like the rights to his music, his image, his likeness, etc. Basically, the other guy is named Michael Channels. Michael Channels says a Manson signed a will that names him as the executor. Freeman and his attorney dispute its validity and a judge has yet to rule. I believe that is where it's at. So we've got Freeman and we've got Channels who are basically trying to lay claim to all things Manson, which in my opinion is kind of twisted. Why would, why would you want that? But at stake are music royalty rights as well as image and publishing rights. Manson was said to have written over 100 songs. Freeman has five recordings himself. One was recorded by Guns N' Roses and another by the Beach Boys. As far as Manson's image, obviously it has not faded from popularity. There are people that still use it and all things Charlie Manson still have a monetary value attached to them, I understand. So we will see what happens with that. Um, <sighs> I don't know what it's gonna do for all the people who are trying to make films about Manson right now. I know there's like two or three Charlie Manson related things like that you're either coming out or have come out. There's something with Hilary Duff, which is about um, Sharon Tate. There's another thing about the Manson girls. Let me just look it up and be more specific. So it looks like Quentin Tarantino is supposedly coming out with a Charles Manson inspired film this summer and it's supposed to star Australian actor Damon Harriman, and it's called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It looks like there's also another movie recently that came out called Charlie Says, which did not get great reviews. This kid, Jason Freeman, he said in this article I read, one of his quotes was, everybody's banking off my grandfather. So I guess he wants to be the one to bank off of his grandfather because he knows that nobody's gonna stop making content or videos or books about Charles Manson. Nobody's gonna stop making movies. Nobody's gonna stop talking about him, writing about him. He was the man who ended the 60s. He killed the 60s. He killed the peace and love and safety that people felt at that time. He was, whether you want to admit it or not, an iconic figure of that time. And People are going to keep talking about him and writing about him and making movies about him because they don't understand and they want to. So this kid, Jason Freeman, knows that's gonna happen and he doesn't want other people to monetarily benefit from his grandfather, that he calls him his grandfather, and he wants to instead, I suppose. That's, that's, my, that's my take on it. Allegedly, supposedly, don't come for me. Charles Manson is still such a hot button issue and even after he dies, he's still causing fights and he's still causing people to argue over him and to get into debates over him and whether he was right and whether he was wrong and whether he's somebody that should be talked about or whether he's somebody that we should let die. What we've got here is a man that will never die. I think a guy who was a simple guy, who was a regular guy, who didn't really have much hope for his future, he found a bunch of kids who followed him, he liked that, he liked the attention, he liked feeling powerful, he liked feeling in charge, and before he knew it, it had spiraled almost to a point that was out of his control. It had taken a life of its own on. And he either put the darkness in those kids or they already had it there and he woke it up. Either way, every single one of those kids who took part in this in some way or the other had that darkness in them. You don't get nice, normal people who 
have a strong moral compass, who know the difference between right and wrong. You don't get a whole bunch of them together and turn them into cold-blooded killers just by telling them that it's what you want or it's the right thing to do or that there's gonna be a race war and you guys gotta go to an underground city and get your fairy wings on. That's not how it works. I'm sorry if you disagree with me, but he did not brainwash them. He obviously controlled them and he manipulated them, but he didn't take good little girls and boys and turn them into mass murderers. He did not. They already had that in them. And you could argue that every single one of us kind of maybe has that inside of us, that innate, natural, animalistic part in us, the kill or be killed kind of instinct inside of us. However, I don't believe that it can be awakened in every single person. I believe it can only be awakened in those who have already thought about it, who have already expressed interest in it, who have already kind of noticed and recognized that dark side of them and liked it and enjoyed how it made them feel. That's my opinion. These kids, all of these kids, the Manson family, the Manson cult, every single one of them who came and stayed and didn't leave at one point, because I get it, you can come to the cult and be like, oh, this is interesting, and then you can be like, this shit's crazy, I gotta get out of here. If you if you showed up to that, that Manson cult, if you showed up to Spawn Ranch and you saw what was going on over the course of a year or two years, over the course of a month, over the course of a week, as soon as you saw the shit was not good, it was dark, it was going down the road where you might be handed a knife and told to stab somebody, that's, that's the time that you leave. That's the time that a normal person leaves. A person who has darkness inside them, a person that's curious about murdering somebody, a person that's curious about being part of a group who murders people, those are the ones that stay. Those are the ones that keep coming back. So in my opinion, everyone who's in prison deserves to be in prison and many who are not in prison should be in prison. Thank you guys so much for being here for this uh, Coffee and Crime Time Manson Family Edition. I will see you guys very soon. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Bye.